And we, we kind of sat down as a lead team and said, hey, what does it mean really to follow Jesus? What does it mean to become like him, like the character of Jesus, what he's like? Because if you spend time with him, you become like him. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? And so um, one of the team members said, well, Jesus was bold, right? He was courageous. He was, um, he was not intimidated by people. And so I just, we just scratched that down as we need to talk about boldness, just the Lord's leading us to do that. And, and one Thursday night during rehearsal, I, I was sitting back there, and I watched Lauren Ionato up here. And the Lord, just like he just highlighted her, put his finger on her and said, she's supposed to talk about that. And so um, I, I came to her and I said, hey, do you have like a testimony of courage or like boldness in your life? And she said, like that is my story, okay? So I want, I want to welcome up Lauren this morning. It's going to give us just a word from the Lord, I believe, today. Will you just welcome her? I've been, I've been so pumped about this. All right, Lauren, we just bless you with just... Um, just the wisdom and just the words from the Lord today to our hearts. God, speak to us and change us today. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, look at us. It is packed in here today. Shout out to the babies. They brought all these people here. <laughs> um, I just want to honor, first of all, uh, Pastor Gunnar and Bethany. They are just the most incredible pastors. <laughs> We've been at the dwelling for a little over two years, and it, it really has, b like, changed our lives. And we're just so thankful for their leadership, and they're even better people, and their kids are amazing, and we're just so thankful for them. Also, shout out to my husband. If you have not met Matthew Ionato, it's probably because you're about to meet him after the service, because he knows everybody. He knows where you work. He knows your aunt's name and he is awesome he leads our connections teams um, and he's definitely the better half um, of us so let me just start by saying that I am probably not like the poster child you would think of for bravery and I say that because we kind of have this like image in our mind of what bravery is and I'm not that I'm not a risk taker um, I'm not gonna go skydiving. I'm not a daredevil. Like, you know, my idea of an adventure is like getting a sonic blast at 9 p.m. <laughs> like, but I wore my slippers in the car, so like, that's crazy. But I am, <laughs> I am calculated. I'm cautious. I'm an overthinker. Um, I'm indecisive. And if we're not friends yet, I'm sure I just told you on being my friend because <laughs> that just sounds like a good time. But somehow, um, in spite of my personality, God has shown me what it means to be brave. And I care about this subject simply because of my immense need for it. I need courage. Therefore, I care about courage. <laughs> And so um, it's been a part of my story, and I'll get to more of that later, but brave is not just for risk takers. It's not just for people who throw all caution to the wind and we're like, wow, that's so brave. Like, it's for all of us. And not only is it for all of us, but we all need it. We all need courage. And so we're going to look at somebody in the Bible um, who had to act in bravery in the face of fear. And we're going to look at Gideon in the Bible. He's in the Old Testament um, in the book of Judges. And to set it up, Israel has been handed over to the Midianites, and they've been um, under the hand of the Midianites for like seven years. And the Midianites are so oppressive, they're plundering like everything that the that the Midianites grow or that the Israelites grow, the Midianites are taking. Um, they take their ox, they take their sheep. Like it's a very hard time to be an Israelite, and the the Israelites are just so over it. They they finally cry out to God for help, and He hears them. And so we're gonna pick up in Judges six verse eleven. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. 
When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So first and foremost, I want to talk about two prerequisites to courage. And the first one we see right here And the first prerequisite to courage is knowing and hearing who God says you are. So the angel comes to Gideon, and he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, if it said, like, he was crushing grapes in a wine press, that would not really be, like, an interesting factor in the story. But it says that he is hiding in a wine press because he's hiding this wheat from the Midianites. And, um... The angel comes and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I kind of imagine Gideon, I feel like if I was Gideon, I'd be like, me? You're talking to me? Like you, you're you're not, he's not talking to me. And there's so many things like we may have said if we came upon Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press, like what are you doing? Why aren't you on the threshing floor? Why are you hiding? And um, not only is Gideon hiding in this wine press, but this angel appears to him, and his first response is like, okay, well, now that you're here, like, I don't see all these signs and wonders that I've heard about. I don't see, you know, the God who brought us out of Egypt. I feel like we've been abandoned. And the Israel, uh, the Israel, the angel, not deterred, like, doesn't answer his questions, is just like, Go in the strength that you have. And then Gideon's like, well, I'm like, you know, like my clan is like the least in the tribe. I'm like the bottom in my family. And he's just saying, he's like, I'm not the right person for this job. I don't, I'm not the one that I think you're looking for. Um, And what I love about this is, the angel calls him a mighty warrior while he's hiding, while he has all these doubts and all these insecurities and he's living in fear. The angel is like, hey, mighty warrior. And God's voice always tells you who you really are. He addresses you as who you really are. When the angel comes to Gideon, in the midst of his fear, in the midst of his doubt, in the midst of his insecurities, he's looking beyond how Gideon feels and beyond what we just see from the surface, and he's like, this is who you really are. Even though you're afraid, it doesn't change who you really are. In the whole first, like, 85 weeks of this series that we've been in, um, <laughs> genuinely, like, I do really love this series, though, so if we just want to do this the rest of the year, I'm fine with that. But we've been talking about what it means to be with Jesus, and we have to be with Jesus to know our identity. We have to be in his presence. We have to be familiar with his voice so that we can hear who we really are. Maybe we feel terrified and we feel like we're not enough and we feel like the least, but God is saying, I'm with you, mighty woman of valor. I'm with you, mighty man of valor. Pastor Gunner just preached a message on identity a couple weeks ago. I think it was the Prince's and Pauper's message. If you have not heard that, you should go listen to it. It's very, very good. And um, it's, it's because it's so important. If we're going to have courage, we first have to hear, I'm with you, mighty warrior. And so 
there's one other essential prerequisite to courage, and it's receiving the love of God. When you recognize and receive the love of God, it makes you brave. And the love of God is not something that you can, like, conjure up. It's not something you can earn. It's not something that, like, you get, you know, enough gold stars and then you get to experience God's love. It's something that is being poured out every minute of every day, every moment. And what makes it hard to receive it is that we have these things in us that make it hard. We have doubts. We have insecurities. We have fears, and it's blocking our ability to receive the love that's already being poured out. And I think often the biggest roadblock to us receiving the love of God is believing him when he says that he loves you. So just start there. You have to start choosing to believe he loves you. And it's super simple. It sounds too simple, but it's like, it's as simple as asking. God, I know that you love me. I know that your love is being constantly poured out on me right now. That's the truth. So I'm going to choose to believe that you love me. Help me receive your love. And it's a miracle when we can receive the love of God. But he is so good and so faithful. Like you can have a miracle every day. And when you have been loved, it's easier to be brave. It makes you brave. Um, many of you know um, our two-year-old son, Matthew. He's one of the small blonde children that runs around here. Um, Matthew is like the sweetest, most gentle, loving little soul. Also, he's super into wrestling right now. And if you have a small child, he's probably tried to tackle him, and I'm sorry. But that's just where he's at in life. It's, it's out of love. But we have a lot of wrestling matches in our house. And usually it goes the same way every time. Matt is the dragon. And I get to be the safe place and, like, the protector and, you know, the, the home base. And so usually Matt will start chasing Matthew around. And Matthew will shriek and then run to wherever I am, probably holding Luca somewhere. And he'll try to hide behind me. He'll try to crawl on top of me. He, like, clings to me like a koala bear. And Matt will kind of turn off and go hide in plain sight because he's a toddler. And um, I will whisper to Matthew, go get him. You can get him. You're strong. You can defeat him. And Matthew will run, 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 and he'll jump on top of Matt, and he'll, like, push him over, and then he'll run back to me and climb up me like a koala bear. <laughs> and when that doesn't work, when the dragon is reawakened, if you will, um, we have one surefire way to beat him, and it's a little goofy. Like, literally, it, it's a little goofy. And... <laughs> See what I did there? And thank you. I've been thinking about that for three days, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. So, <laughs> whoo. Um, so I've had this Goofy since I was four years old, okay? This Goofy wore an eye patch when I had to wear an eye patch as a kid. Like, we roll deep, like. So now my sons play with him and he is like, this, I realize this does not make sense. He is how you defeat the dragon. So I, when Matthew runs back over to me, I'll say, okay, buddy, you have to get Goofy. Where's Goofy? You have to get Goofy. So he'll take this Goofy and he'll hold him like this. And he'll run, 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 run. And then he'll go ah, with all his little might and push the Goofy into Matt. And Matt is defeated ultimately. But... <laughs> Why do I tell this story? Um, <laughs> because it's a small and like imperfect way to show what bravery can look like. Matthew comes to me for reassurance, for a reminder that he can do it. He's strong, he's brave. A quick fill up of love, and then he goes. I give him the tools 
that he needs. We also have a song that works. Um, <laughs> I give him the tools he needs, and then I tell him, like, you can do it. Go. And this is what our Heavenly Father does for us. He addresses us as we really are. When we're with him, he tells us and reminds us who we are. He fills us up with his love. He gives us the tools we need. He provides a safe place. He plants and waters a seed of courage. And then he says, go in the strength that you have. I'm with you. Once we start to hear who God says we are and we start to receive his love, then we can walk courageously and bravely and take our next right step. Courage and bravery is different for every single person. And I think this is where we kind of get it twisted in our heads. Like we think it's just these big things, but bravery starts small. It's small yeses. It's these small seeds. Hearing who you really are, receiving his love, that plants the seed. And then when you're reminded who you are, you keep receiving his love, that seed gets watered. Taking a step, saying like a brave yes, it's watering this seed of courage. And if you've ever planted a seed, I literally grew like three things one time, and so now everything in my head is a garden analogy. But if a seed is well watered, and it's, it gets the right amount of sun, and it's planted in good soil, it will grow. And this is good news for us because it means that our courage and bravery can grow. When God called Gideon, he wasn't just like, okay, now go, go into the battle. There was all these steps along the way. Okay, first I want you to build an altar. First I want you to go spy on the camp. First I want you, then I want you to recruit the people. And there was these small steps along the way that Gideon said yes to, albeit afraid. If you read his story, almost every point in the story, the angel's like, and if you're afraid, you can take someone with you. And then it'll be like, and Gideon took someone with him. And so it's not that he wasn't still afraid, but he started saying one small yes at a time. And if we want to recognize bravery in ourselves and everyone around us, then we have to redefine what it is. So for some people, it can be brave just to ask someone to hang out. It can be brave to have a hard conversation with your spouse. It can be brave to call that therapist you've been meaning to call. It can be brave to trust your instincts. It can be brave to be vulnerable. It can be brave to say yes, but it can also be brave to say no. It can be brave to go, but it can also be brave to wait. And it's different for everybody. The small yeses and the small moments of bravery are what help us for the big moments. They lead us through the big moments because if I say yes, this small yes, and then this small yes, and this small yes, now I have a history of being brave, but more importantly, I have a history of God's faithfulness in my own story. And here's the tension. He's going to be faithful anyway. <laughs> He's faithful when you say no. He's faithful when you're not brave. But... When I am, when I take the next brave step, I get to experience intimacy with him and his faithfulness in a new and different way. It becomes like not just faithfulness that I know about, but faithfulness I have lived in my life. His faithfulness is not dependent on me being courageous, but there is a new level of relationship with him when we step, take these steps of bravery. And when we start to see these brave moments in our own life and we start to recognize them, we also start to see them in other people. And we can be part of watering those little seeds of courage in other people. I have never met anybody who like did not need to be encouraged, who was like, I'm good. Like, you don't even need to compliment me. You don't even need to encourage me. Like, I'm totally fine. The Lord is my sustainer. I don't know anybody like that. So <laughs> what's great is that this is why community exists. In encouragement, it's, it's 
putting courage in someone. It's giving courage, encouragement. And when you see it, those small steps, the hard decisions that your friends make, the, you know, the, how they're navigating different things that they're walking through, if you will just acknowledge it, it waters the seed. Man, I know that was hard. That's so brave that you did that. Wow, you're like, man, you have such a good instinct about that. You're doing a great job. Like, you're watering the seed of courage. You're putting courage in someone. Adam, if you want to go ahead and come back and play the guitar. Um, so my story, wow, that timing of that pad. <laughs> My story, um, I have struggled with anxiety most of my life. And I can remember, you know, it was like a lot of my life. And I, oh, I got, sorry, I can't help but hear the bad. <laughs> um, but I got to moments when I realized like, man, this is like really stealing from me. This is stealing my joy. Like, this is stealing purpose from me. And sometimes you just have to get tired enough of something to be like, you know what? I'm not okay with this. And I had canceled so many flights. I had more airline vouchers than anybody did in 2020 because I would, like, plan to do things, and then I would be so anxious the day of I would just cancel my flight and not go. I wouldn't go lead worship places. I wouldn't go do like songwriting camps. I wouldn't like, I just wouldn't go see friends. I was like, I can't do it. I'm too anxious. I can't do it. And so I remember this one particular trip. We were going on a regional college retreat to the mountains in North Carolina. I worked for a college ministry in Jacksonville and I was 25 at the time. I was supposed to be going on this retreat um, as a staff member and I was gonna be leading worship, and I was gonna be speaking at the retreat, which I had never done before. And so we wake up, like the morning we're supposed to go, we get to the church where we're meeting, and I'm like basically hiding in a closet at this church, so anxious, like telling my pastor's wife, like, I can't do it. I want to, but like I can't. I wish that I could, but I can't. And I'm talking to her, and somehow in this conversation, I realized, like, okay, what can I do? Like, what is the one thing? So I started breaking the whole weekend down into, like, one step. And so I told her, I was like, okay, I will get in the car, and I will start driving. And that is all I'm committing to right now is just that I'm going to be driving you know, I'm going to be driving anyway. I'll just drive north. And I don't even think I drove. I think Leah drove, and I watched Friends in the front seat <laughs> to distract myself. So we start driving. We get a little, like, couple hours in. We stop for gas, and I was like, okay, we can keep driving. I'm going to say yes to just keep, keep driving, and then we'll see what happens. I don't know what happens, you know. And so we get there. We get checked in. We start setting up our sound equipment. Um, you know, we're about to have sound check, and I was like, okay, I will stay tonight, and then I'll just leave in the morning. Makes sense. I'm already all the way here. I might as well, you know. And what started to happen is as I broke these down into small yeses and moments of courage, God was watering this seed, and I started to actually enjoy it and have fun. And I could feel the Holy Spirit in the room. And I was enjoying being with my friends and being with the students. And each small yes led to this big yes. And that trip ended up being really significant in a lot of ways. Um, but when I look back and I think about it, I'm like, wow, God was always with me. All these moments I've had, anxious, when I've said no, when I've taken one step like he's been in them all in the moments that I didn't go in the moments that I was paralyzed but then in the moments of this small 
brave, yes. He came alongside me, and we did more than I could ever do by myself. And I've done things in my life, like not just big things, like literally ordinary small things that would be small to other people, but they were a big deal to me because he watered the seed. He told me who I really was. He kept pouring out his love, and I started to believe him. And then I would say, like, one little brave yes. And then he would bring people alongside me that put courage in me, that encouraged me over and over. And now we have a history. And I, I still feel anxious at times. And I am a firm believer in therapy I go to therapy regularly. I think everybody should go to therapy. I've been on medication in different seasons of my life. And there's a place for all of that. This is not an anxiety seminar. There's a place for all that stuff. But I tell you, nothing has changed my life like building a history with God. Nothing like seeing him meet me over and over and over and over. And now when I need to take a brave step, I'm like, well, I know you're going to be there. If nothing else, if this is a total failure, if this doesn't count for anything, you and me are going to do it together. And that's enough. That's enough to get to be with him in relationship. It always comes back to relationship with him. He doesn't need you to be brave just so he can use you. He wants you to be brave because he's like, we're going to get tight. We're in relationship. We get to do this together. In in verse 15 of, of Judges 6, Gideon says, how can I save Israel? And in verse 16, it says, the Lord answered him, I will be with you. That's it. Like, how can I do it? I don't have this. I'm not this. I'm not enough. I can't do this. I don't have the skills. He's like, doesn't matter because I'll be with you. I will be with you. We can walk in courage because we're never alone. When we know who we are, when we know how deeply we're loved, we can do the, just the next right thing, even if we're afraid because God is so faithful. He's so good. And our faithful God comes alongside us, tells us who we are, loves us, and waters those little seeds of courage. And they grow and grow and grow. And I don't know where you are this morning. Only the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit knows each heart in this room. Maybe you don't even know who you are. You don't know your identity. Maybe you don't know what it's like to receive the love of God. Maybe you are just having a hard time taking one step, or you don't know what the one step is, maybe. Maybe you just need to be reminded that you have a history with a faithful God. You need to go start writing out, man, you were there when I did this. When this happened and I didn't know what was going to happen, you were there. When we didn't know how we were going to pay the bills, we did. When When I didn't know how to handle this, it got handled. And when you start looking back, you see already there was a faithful God in your history. Maybe you want to start building that history today. You can literally do one thing, and now you have a history. Like, take one step. I don't know where you are, but the Holy Spirit knows where you are, and I believe that he has something for you this morning. And so all I'm going to do is pray and just let him do what he does. God, we thank you for your presence. You are enough for us. Honestly, if you did nothing else for us, you have done more than enough. But because of who you are, God, we know that you are faithful. We know that you are good not just because we read it in your word, but we can see it in our life. Give us eyes to see your faithfulness, God. And for those of us who who have never experienced your love, 
who have never heard you say, I'm with you, mighty warrior, would you speak now? Pour out your love. Open us up to receive your love. God, help us. Thank you, Lord, for watering the seeds of courage all over this room. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.